summer trainings. It's already smoking hot here in Louisiana. A lot of guys training, a lot of camps going off. Another big camp this weekend. And uh, I'm trying to get everything going live here. Let's see what I can get finished. So if you got any questions, right now we're up on YouTube, Periscope. Uh, I'm going live on Facebook. So um, I'm live on Facebook. I'm going live on... I'm going to go live on Instagram as well. So if um, it'll let me go live. Here it goes. All right, we're live. All right, so I'm going to get up my YouTube so I can see if there's any questions. It's easy for me to get to questions on... Um, it's easy for me to get to questions on Instagram and, and Facebook. The only thing I don't like I don't like about Facebook is with the questions they don't they don't they give you a character limit and it doesn't really let me see more. So uh, Instagram might be actually a better platform for that. Which is up right now. Kind of moving this one around. All right, there we go. Going on YouTube to make sure you guys are there. What's up, guys? Hello? How are you, man? See y'all coming in on Instagram? Sorry, I'm logging into my YouTube right now. So, just any any questions? I haven't done this in a while. I just wanted to give you guys an opportunity. I know it kind of jumped on you to uh, answer questions. The draft is current. I haven't really been paying attention. Tell Corey to stop standing around and do something. All right. He's, he's way back there. I don't want to distract him. I think he's trying to do something. I'll tell him you're you're reaching out to him now. All right, almost there. So if you're on YouTube, you're asking questions. I want to make sure I can get to those questions. So I'm looking for that right now. There we are. All right, I got some questions here, finally. Nice haircut. Thanks, Nelson. Wish you were here, Nelson. Francis Nelson saying, hey, man. Uh, Brasher, what's up, Brasher? When's the running throwing program coming running th running throw program that's a good one a little comedy starting off I like it the pressure for med ball target throws from your knee are you supposed to stand up partially before you drive and throw I tell that's the only drills where I want your foot front foot on the ground and you do you're gonna lift a little off the knee and then start your drive immediately it's like Nelson right here he said nice haircut uh, it makes you look younger <laughs> um, hey, what weighted, what weight balls can I use with my 13-year-old in hockey? So, you know, we, we don't like using weighted baseballs, but we'll use med balls. And if we're doing anything over two pounds, we're doing it below the shoulder. And if we're doing anything uh, under two pounds, two hands, we do it over the shoulder through the kinetic chain, teaching the kinetic chain. So make sure when you... Our, our thing is, is in anything we do, we really need to have a good biomechanical base. And because the technique's important to getting, when we load, to distribute the stress evenly. So we, uh, we, we can make, uh, we can increase performance without pu pushing towards in, uh, injury. I forgot, I gotta turn the radio off here. So I'm about to kill the radio. All right, there we go, killing the radio. So they're not gonna like that, but don't wanna get popped for copyright with the radio on, right? Another question, I think I saw one up here on Instagram. Look at the fresh cut, thank you, Royer. Would med ball stuff be the best way to increase hip to shoulder separation? 
good question. For us, it's been the best way. Why is it the best way? Because we start off in drills where our hips are open, where our hips are open, in a feet straight position initially, and our shoulders are closed. We then use a two-pound ball, I mean a two-handed two-pound ball, because if I use two hands, uh, I can't pull away. I can't initiate the left side early. And a lot of guys who don't separate fly open, right? So if I'm in a two-handed position, hips open, shoulders closed, or I can't pull early, pull that hand away, I have to stay connected to the ball, then it's going to force me to hold the shoulders closed longer to allow the hips to drive the energy. If the hips don't drive the energy, then that's why you typically go to the glove side. So to me, it's the best way to really understand and learn and perfect hip to shoulder separation. It's what I did in my career. It was very effective. And then I believe a lot of the guys here um, have benefit, benefited from it a lot. David Guerreri, can you explain the good or bad of bending the elbow too much prior to layback? Okay, so what he's talking about is if his, this is flexion, right? So when I cock the arm, I'm in flexion. When it's too much flexion, when I go to lay back, is when that elbow wants to push forward. So if that elbow wants to push forward um, up ahead of the shoulder, then that delays pronation and will increase, could it it's also increases the load and it holds the load longer because it delays pronation. So if I cock the arm and I'm too aggressive inside 90 and then I turn and my elbow goes like this, which it typically wants to as opposed to it's out here, it wants to hold back, it's here, it wants to push out, that's a bad position to be in during layback. So I always say somewhere just to 90, slightly inside, slightly outside, doesn't matter. I've seen guys, anybody, success in here. It's when they're way in here when it's like boom, and we get into bad positions. Brent, what is your opinion on having pitchers sit on a bucket to train the force vector or bucket drills in general? Um, yeah, I think a bucket's fine. I mean, I know John Madden talks about that. I like, uh, we use plyo boxes. We actually put our hands down, arms loaded, uh, in torsion, and then we open and drive. That's in our level three program. A uh, bucket can work. Um, typically, the way we do it, the bucket feels a little unstable if it's, if it's not heavy. How many reps and how many times a week for the two pound med balls? So, in the program, it's three, usually three times a week, and um, it depends where you are in the program based on your reps and uh, also the positions. We have all different positions and series of drills you're progressing through. So. Ideally, I'd say get the program. There's a lot to it. So, How to correct. So how to correct this issue, right? It's keeping the ball away. So I, I, I teach kids where it's like the whip, right? If we're going to drive energy through the whip, if I'm going to you know, start with the handle of the whip here, bring the whip up and reverse the direction to create the pop, the goal is, is, as I peak the handle, I'm getting the end to move as far away from the handle as possible. That's why I start up, to get the end moving away as the handle is peaking down. So I have to do the same thing with the hip. I want to get the hip peaking forward as the end is moving away. So just teaching them the understanding of staying in flexion, moving the end away from the handle as you peak forces through the hip is a way to correct the problem of over aggressive inside 90s. Baseball man, 99, how to get a linear front leg. Okay, so a linear front leg, meaning I would assume an extending front leg moving you linear. You know, the front leg can extend in rotation, right? Just this hip being ahead and the back hip coming around creating rotation, that extends my knee. So your, your front leg will extend in rotation, but if you want it linear, meaning if you want your trunk to go more linear, then you almost need to be, when you hit front foot, already in a good amount of rotation. 
and then a lot of delay. So now the hips are open, driving the shoulders around because of all that separation. And as that shoulder comes around, now you have time to even add to that force. So it's like, if, if I don't already have linear momentum down the mound and a delay of the trunk to, to transfer or receive that, and I go to extend my leg, it's just gonna accelerate what I'm already doing. So really the front leg is just gonna accelerate what's already happening. If you're rotating, it's just gonna accelerate rotation. And if you're building a lot of more linear momentum and separating, it's going to accelerate that linear trunk. So just think of it, if you don't have, if you haven't established how you wanna move down the mound, either you know short and rotational, or long and linear with rotation, you can do, you can add rotation there, then your front leg is just gonna accelerate whatever you have. What's your opinion on what age to start lifting weights? So there's no studies that find a negative correlation to early weightlifting. It's usually the other way around. Those studies that I saw that those who lift younger are typically healthier later, later in life. Uh, they typically, weight train more in the life. Um, uh, studies show that it was as beneficial for young, for the youth to lift as, it, as or more beneficial than adults. So I believe you can lift anytime you want. It's just when you haven't gone through puberty, the loading isn't gonna be as effective on the body as if you're in puberty, where you have the hormones to create hypertrophy. So. Basically, beginner lifting needs to be more technical, proprioception, meaning like central nervous system, body awareness stuff. Really the general comp components of lifting um, should be the focus when you're young. So you can, you can do, we have beginners come in, learn the technique of the lifts, do a lot of the beginner stuff. You know, they're probably actually, it's better to do more strength stuff than it is a lot of plyometric stuff. Like you want to be careful on high velocity stuff just because there's not a lot of stability or good kinetic chain in a young kid. Loading for, uh, torques and forces aggressively could just cause earlier injury. Sorry, I'm getting this light out of my face. But any age, just understand that there's specific programming for your age. Just want to make sure you're doing that correctly. Okay, I'm jumping to Instagram, a lot of questions on Instagram at this point. I just want to go down the row, make sure I don't miss them. Where do you get the med balls? I go off of Amazon. I like the power system balls. Did your med ball stuff be, okay, we did that. All right, so next one after that question. How to fix leaning back when trying to load for rotation? Okay. I don't even mean load for rotation. I'm not sure exactly what you mean, but maybe you're saying load into hip rotation or load into the femur rotation. How do you fix leaning back? So I guess maybe you're leaning too aggressive um, when you're trying to hold torsion. Uh, it's just, just keeping balance, really. Coming out of your leg lift, keeping your chin right with your belt buckle or right behind your belt buckle not overemphasizing pushing the hip. Um, I, I've had guys have to do the opposite. They actually had to push their hips the other way as they moved forward to stay in the hip. Because when they pushed it this way, they, they collapsed the leg. So they would push the hip the other way as they would fall forward and they would sit in torsion better, which is interesting. It's very interesting to see it that way. Son is 14. I've been training him for five, about five years now in 3X. Thank you, William. William Grimes. Good to hear. This season he has started having pain in his lower back. Well, that sucks. Hip, glute area of his landing leg. Any suggestions? Tight hips is what I'm, I'm assuming, and poor posture. Make sure a lot of the guys will cut out the core routines in the program. That becomes a serious problem if you have a weak core or really tight hips and what happens is your psoas starts to uh, knot up. Your psoas starts to become overactive because it's stabilizing 
your lumbo, lumbar spine. So, um, and then you get the low back pain, you get the hip, even pain, tightness. So it sounds like okay, more than likely not enough emphasis on the core routine. Um, also too, maybe more than likely, he needs to do the mobility work in the hips to open up the hips. If the hip complex, so the way it works is if the hip complex is tight, so if this is the femur and this is, um, hey Matt, do you have the skeleton over here? I'm going to show you the skeleton. It up. It up. Hey, just make sure you put your hand under the wheels, like the base of the wheels, because they're probably all going to drop off. So basically, I'll try to show you the skeleton, but if these are the femurs and then this is the spine, if all of this is knotted up so, and you're moving and this can't you know, move around with it, this is just locked up and it's all like, what happens is like farther up the chain, it starts moving. So maybe it's even like a few vertebrae up the back. There you go. Nice work. All right, so like Jimmy here, Here's the femurs. If this, all the musculature in here is tight, and here is tight, and all through here is tight, then these femurs can't move around. The pelvis can't even move. The pelvis actually uh, rotates in and out, creates uh, torsion, and, and actually when you walk, you, ha you have a lot of pelvis movement uh, within the, the joints of the pelvis, like within the, the whole plate. So if, if that's so tight and you can't move, then all the vertebrae are just trying to create the movement and, and the flexibility. And then you start having the pain, say in the you know first few vertebrae, it's, it's, it's having to move for the pelvis. And then you're, that's where you're having all the pain. So you gotta stretch the hip capsules. You can, um, I mean, opening up the hip capsules will release a lot of the tension in the hip complex. There's so many, uh, muscles through the hip and the more tight that gets you typically have more back problems and knee problems I mean the stress starts going up the chain please tell Francis Jackson Bridges says hey Francis everybody's asking for you man yeah Bridges says hey oh Jackson says hey is he is he He's, he's going through time to time. He's he's been for the throwing program. All right. Well, Jackson, let us know what we can do with you, brother. Jackson, tell Brent how we used to foam roll the foam rollers. <laughs> tell him about that one. <laughs> uh, once have a lot. Wait. Once have a low UCL strain. Had I guess had. Do you believe the velo can get back up? Yes. UCL is just the ligament, so it is a stabilizer, but also your flexor mass, your bicep, your tricep are all stabilizers of the elbow. Also, too, if you're better stabilizing the whole kinetic chain, then you're going to be in a place to uh, help the UCL. So if the UCL is strained, you, the, your body will lay down tissue to help rebuild it. Um, it won't be the same, um, and it doesn't rebuild the same amount of integrity in the UCL, but like I said, if those muscles can come overcompensate, get stronger, then you should be where you left off. But once again, it comes into velocity as a component of the kinetic chain. So you need to get your legs more explosive, your hips more mobile to transfer your energy into a late trunk, and then the get the connect or the motor control of using your trunk, of learning how your trunk is the best, the better predictor of velocity, which I just posted a study on Instagram or all my social media today showing that the trunk timing and power was the better predictor of velocity between the difference of a high school and professional pitcher. So you really need to tap into that kinetic chain. It's true the foam rollers get tight sometimes and you have to foam roll the foam rollers. Hey, he said it's true. He said sometimes the foam rollers get tight, you gotta foam roll the foam rollers. <laughs> He's laughing. <laughs> How's it going? How's it going? How to fix leaning? Are we to that one? Um, when doing the med ball throws, I have noticed that occasionally I get some shoulder pain. 
Is, this, is there a specific reason that is happening? Yes, you have weak shoulders and you're trying to use arms. That typically is, happens with guys that are weak. So um, two things you can do, you drop down to a basketball. So go to a one pound ball or less and uh, on the med balls and also get uh, your build your upper body strength. Probably have very weak grip strength, weak upper body strength, which is all very important. And sometimes you don't feel that with the baseball because it's so light initially. But over time, your arm will break down from the baseball for the same weakness. So, like I said, pull back on the way to the med ball if you need it. Learn to use the lower half and, and, pull, and not overuse the arm. And, um, and then get stronger in the upper body, which is all a part of our program. Any comments on Lenny Torres, Steve from New York? Yeah, Lenny's challenges were always his hips. And it's it's a it's a tough place to be when you are a high performance athlete like Lenny and you throw very hard and you 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 struggle to to really use your kinetic chain well because um, of the hip tightness and, and it's something where it's not like he doesn't want to use his hips well. <coughs> he just has very tight uh, hip flexors or, or, or his hip capsules. So what's happening is he's overcompensating on, you know, say he gets tired, he starts overcompensating, or his hips get tight, he starts overcompensating. So it's just, Lenny, Lenny was doing a lot of the right things, um, I hear, through, uh, through his guys in New York. It just, at the end of the day, is it, it, was it enough? It, it, it obviously wasn't enough. Um, it's a tough, man. This is, it's, it's really hard at that level. Um, to do all the work for yourself. I really kind of wish clubs would have better assessment tools for understanding the kinetic chain. Like how much stress is he putting and torques is he putting on his arm each throw? Uh, is it getting worse? Is it getting better? And, you know, is, is the hip tightening up? Like we, d we need a lot more things in place for these high performance guys to prevent their injuries we need to be monitoring their joints every game every throw um, you know for example like Steven Strauss where I remember his first UCL tear uh, they said it they had MRI it like a month before it tore and when they went to MRI it again it was completely ripped from the bone it's it's all it's gotten to a place where these guys are so elite and they move so well and so explosively and everybody has problems at the end of the day everybody has problems uh, they're not monitoring them consistently enough, which is a lot to ask. But um, when it comes down to someone's career on the line, you'd, you'd hope they would be able to do that. Early live. So to Gary. Shout out to Gary. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I thought we'd get in here. We got guys training. We got a little herd back there having fun. Jimmy's kind of blocking them. See, we got uh, how can you prevent back soreness after pitching? So it depends what the back is. Is it lat soreness here or is it low back soreness? So low back soreness would be coming from the deceleration of the trunk going forward, which is an indication of good biomechanics, but just uh, overuse. So that comes from the posterior chain. How I would make sure I have a long enough hamstring, something measuring to 100 degrees of hip flexion, to where I have the length and the time to decelerate my back. And then I would be very much working on a strong posterior chain to be able to uh, handle that stress and not allow the low back to try to pick up some of the slack, which is probably what's happening. So focus on hamstring length, uh, posterior chain strength. The lats, so, you know, the lats get very sore. Sometimes, you know, that's in the back, up to the middle of the back. Th those are big uh, movers. Those move the theme or the humerus internal, external rot and rotation. Uh, it's an accelerator. So think about it. It's an accelerator and a decelerator. So it takes a lot of abuse. Um, one of the, uh, I got the the iPad about to die. Let me let me save the iPad here. I'm going to save the iPad.
see how long that works. Looks like I got it. Okay. Hey, can you grab me that fly box? So with the lats, um, it's good to be sore in the lats just because with all the throws. You put it right here. All right. So the lats, you know, it's something that you just need to keep uh, mobility. So I would be stretching them, keeping, that, don't let that tissue bunch up. Thanks, man. And then, um, there you go, perfect. And then also make sure they um, they stay strong. So that's something that you want to make sure you put some time, and especially if you're off season, strengthening them. All right, what else you got? Long distance conditioning versus short sprint conditioning. Both. More focus on certain one to maximum performance. Well, there's really zero need for a pitcher to run long distance. Zero need to do that. Um, it actually works against you. It decreases testosterone, studies show. And why does it decrease testosterone? Well, if you look at cross country runners to sprinters, Cross country runners have smaller bodies than sprinters. Sprinters are more developed because to create that explosive movement, fast twitch muscle movement, which is typically fueled through uh, ATP um, or, or phosgen creatine ATP, that uh, muscle hypertrophies. It, it needs size, right? The long distance muscles are more slow twitch dominant fiber, which runs more on fats and I mean run, it, it, oxygen it runs for long it can run for longer periods of time so it's a it's a more lean muscle or actually more lean it's actually a fattier muscle but not as um as as, as hypertrophy the reason testosterone is going to decrease if you do a lot of long distance running because your body's going to remodel to more slow twitch which is a smaller muscle and it doesn't need the the size so you're going to lose your testosterone because you're getting smaller so long distance running is going to make you smaller. And there's also studies that link a loss in mass is, it correlates to loss in velocity. So that, that is, these are big negatives. Also, there was a study that showed it affected your eccentric elastic energy. So your ability to load and unload. Um, that explosiveness, right? Because that's where a lot of that explosiveness is and that elastic eccentric movements. Um, so... I really try to steer guys away from any long distance running. It's very old school. Yeah, you see, you can see elite pitchers using it. Well, if they already genetically have a lot of fast switch muscle fiber that their body keeps on genetically, they're lucky it's not affecting it. But if you're someone who's having to build your explosiveness and then you go long distance run, you're working against yourself. It's not smart. So um, we. There's really no need for it. There's no point in pitching where you're breathing heavy. You're never on the mound going, right? You're on the mound going, that, right? So you're that 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 is that you exploding, right? So that's a sprint. That's something where sprinting as fast as you can. It's up, just like you are in the mound. So sports sports specificity. Training is close to the demands of your skill. It's very beneficial uh, for pitching or for any sport. So uh, I, I usually highly recommend you to avoid uh, long distance running. Where's Francis? Francis, more guys asking for you, man. I don't know why everybody likes Francis so much over here. Getting some love. You recommend weighted ball training in off season. We only use med ball training no weighted baseball training, only med ball training. Two hand med ball training will protect your arm while in improving and building a more elite kinetic chain. Right here, Chris Q31. Where is Francis Diaz? Where is Francis Diaz? Chris what is, is a this? beast. He's a beast. What is this? Great minds think alike. What is this? You're a celebrity, man. Hey, man, Brenda, I got one. Thank you, Frank. How do I progress my 3x throws over four months? In the program, you gotta follow the program, right? So we start off in linear positions, we work to lateral positions, 
Uh, we have three drills per series, um, and we blend those in with the baseball uh, drills as well. It's all in the program, man. Where do you find your studies? Google Scholar. Just go Google Scholar. Pitching. 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 It'll come up. Um, also, too, I'm at a university called uh, A.T. Still University. It's a medical university. I'm getting my kinesiology degree. I'm about a year away. I'm almost there. And they have a library, and I get a lot of them there. So the ones in Google Scholar that you can't download, uh, you you can buy them or you can be in a university. If you're in a university, you should be able to go to your university library and access those studies. That's probably a better way to say it. If you college guys out there are interested in, in collecting these studies, go to your library and ask for um, access to peer-reviewed medical studies. Like, how can you get access to that? I'm more than likely going to give you an online interface that you log into through your student account and you're going to be able to uh, pull up any study you want on pitching, throwing, training. It's all there. I would love for you guys to do that because it gets really old, me being the only one I feel like doing this. So it would be nice to see more guys actually educating themselves on baseball. Kevin Duke, the difference in when a pitcher should feel soreness-wise after a 40-pitch game versus an 80-pitch game. Well, it really comes down to are they conditioned for either one of those? So if I'm more conditioned for a 40-pitch game and I go to an 80-pitch game, I should be pretty exhausted. My CNS should be exhausted. My arm should be extremely fatigued. My legs should be fatigued. My core should be fatigued. But my arm fatigue should be pretty high. Um, so I, it just really comes down there. There really should be nothing, no different between pitch limits it has to do with how conditioned you are for that amount of pitches at that amount of rest. So just because you're conditioned for 80 pitches and you throw 80 pitches two days in a row doesn't mean you shouldn't be sore on the second day. It really is, was I recovered before the 80 pitches and was I conditioned to throw 80 pitches with that recovery? If I had trained to throw 80 pitches two days in a row, Potentially, you could do it, and maybe not at the velocity you want, maybe not uh, every five days. The point is, you have to eventually condition your body to the workload, um, and throwing isn't enough because at the end of the day, throwing doesn't strengthen your arm. We have studies showing uh, the average pitcher's throwing arm is weaker than the average public throwing arm, or arm, either arm. We show that studies show that pitchers have weaker throwing arms than um, position players. So throwing doesn't weak or doesn't strengthen the arm. It, if anything, it maybe strengthens it internally, but it doesn't strengthen it uh, in the external rotation of posterior shoulder. So we're actually weakening throwing. So throwing isn't the way to condition for 80 pitches. Um, because when you, I mean, obviously if you throw, your legs are taking all the work, but you should have some, some additional training like we do here. So those 80 pitches is not just in your arm. It's in your legs, it's in your core, and your body's prepared for that. Sorry, man, no Espanol. Alex, Alex, you need to start uh, get, getting your, es your Spanish going. Maybe Alex on Top V Latino can do uh, a Q&A session like this. Alex, uh, this is Fran. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ruin the name. So F-R-A-N-C-H-E-U. R Y, and his last name is B A L B U E N A. He's from the Dominican Republic. Alex, he's asking for Spanish. So, let me get Alex to do a little Spanish Q and A session for you guys. Is it okay to do anaerobic conditioning the day before doing legs? <laughs> we program it after, so, and it's typically. Uh, not a, a day, and you're not doing legs the next day, typically. It can happen that way, but not not, not often. Once again, I'd suggest getting in our programming. We have a lot of programming. What's the difference between the level three program and the level one program? Well, the level three program is for those who have a 1.3 power to weight ratio, so that's 130% of your body weight. 
if you can clean 130% of your body weight, you can go into level three. Level three is for someone who is more than likely had a lot of success. They're maybe teetering into high 80s, low 90s, and they really want to be more consistent 90s. That's really why I built it for some of those, those guys. And there's also a level after that that we don't sell. We don't sell because um, I don't, because anything I sell, people can just do it right out of the gate. It's something I want you to graduate to. So you have to go, you'd have to contact me personally to get that level. Um, but level three has a lot of the biomechanical stuff, the torsion throws, the sled drills, sled loads, drives, which are great, which are awesome. But once again, I don't really want you into the sled work until you've got the good hip to shoulder separation and the, and the leg power is there. Because if not, you're just gonna you're gonna struggle and you're gonna overcompensate and it's not gonna work with your biomechanics. Um, the lifting has a lot of chains, submaximal holds, a lot of it's a big emphasis on power, just trying to create elite power. Um, I like the program, it's fun. How do you describe counter rotation and how much of it is healthy for the spine? So counter rotation is when your shoulders are pulling counter or countering away from your hip rotation so at this position my hips and shoulders are open in this position my shoulders are countering you know 40 degrees 50 degrees away from my hip position so if you're obviously only going to go as much as your thoracic spine will allow it ideally you want the rotation to be in your thoracic only about 15 percent of rotation should be in your lumbar spine and it's, it's really how your spine works. If you look at Jimmy here, okay. If you look at the spinal cord is going through here. And if you notice, the, the vertebrae are way thicker down here than up here. And they're a lot lighter too because the hole for the spinal cord is bigger because there's more arteries going through here. So these are really light bones up here that um, have a lot more mobility. Down here, a lot heavier, more dense, smaller space on, I think, in the spinal cord region. And um, so the, this isn't really made to, made to be mobilized. This is made to be mobilized all through here. So we really, we really wanna just create rotation and extension in here and try to create stability here. That's the goal on any type of spinal movement, specifically in loading the spine and throwing. Athletes throw harder, explosive athletes, explosive athletes throw harder, run faster, hit harder, be explosive, I like it. How do you describe counter rotation? Can I just, is it good if your groin is sore after pitching? Well, there's a lot of adduction activity in gracialis, um, going into front foot strike. That guys can overuse that to help drive the femur around to, to rotate the pelvis. So, yes, you should get, you'll be very sore. Also in your hamstring, because it kind of goes around to your hamstring as well. I used to cramp in my hamstring on my throwing leg side, my throwing arm side. But, yeah, you... You're doing that. So if you have, if, but see, we want you to have more lower leg, so lower leg drive. If you have more lower leg drive, <coughs> then that's less adduction uh, uh, power or contractions you have to use to create the femur rotation into the pelvis rotation. Thanks for all the hearts, guys. Well, that's pretty cool on Instagram. Thank you all. little heart war going on. Lose fat and build lean muscle mass. I, I don't even think you need to lose fat, guys. Big league, uh, the, if you look at the fat percentage of body fat as you go up levels of the game in professional baseball, the body fat actually goes up. What, what's up, Ro uh, Roman? This is on um, Facebook. How many pitch in practice pitcher? Sorry, I couldn't understand that last one, Riviera. You can re-post that. Last off-season, I improved my hip extension and internal rotation. And I can rotate and extend my hip faster, but no increase in velocity. Well, here's the thing. Your motor control 
if you have tight hips, doesn't use your trunk. It just probably spins. So if this opens up, which would allow it to push my hip more forward, now you have to change your motor control to feel that energy or take that energy from the legs and bring your trunk forward. So just because you change your anatomy doesn't mean you're, you, drop, you throw pitch better. For example, just because you put, um, you know, just, be just because you put a, a, an app in your phone to help you in school doesn't mean it's going to help you. You still have to understand how the app or the, or the software uh, or even the hardware, you know, maybe you got an iPad as opposed to, a, you know, a, a, a notepad, right? So you're not going to truly benefit it until you understand how it can help you and benefit you in your biomechanics. So you got to make sure now that you have the improved anatomy or the hardware, how can I adapt my software to take advantage of it? How often do you guys work with sidearm submarine pitchers? Also, what are some velocity tips for submarine pitchers? You know, I like to uh, recommend John Heisinger with AZ Fuel or Fuel Factory Baseball, Fuel Factory Baseball in Arizona. Heisinger or Zinger is um, he's is a more sidearm guy. It's not that we we stay away from it. I just am going to teach the kinetic chain where it's optimal, and that's an overhand th overhead throw. If you want to learn the kinetic chain this way, because it's important that you train and get a good, efficient, explosive kinetic chain, all you have to do is make the adjustment back to the arm slot by changing the trunk orientation. So typically in our biomechanics, we're in a more contralateral trunk orientation. So if this is, if I'm throwing this way and I'm a righty, this is ipsilateral, this is contralateral. So I just need to make sure that when I go to go sidearm, I bring my trunk ipsilateral. I do the same things that we do, separation and everything, but now because of that ipsilateral position, it's just gonna bring my arm slide down. And ultimately, we're trying to stay in the same spot. So sh shoulder above elbow, just above elbow, okay? So over the top, we'd be here. This would be, you know, this would be three quarters. This could be over the top. And see, I, I went contralateral to get there. I didn't, I'm not doing this. I wanna get this into that 95, 100 degree slot. I want to get this not fully extended, but somewhere from here to here. And then everything else is trunk. So if I want to go sidearm, I just do this. Now I'm sidearm, right? Or I do this, and I'm sidearm. I do want to avoid full extension because that means I'm just rotating. So it's just purely same biomechanics, over the top, three quarters, sidearm. That's the difference. So once you learn the kinetic chain, that's where you make your adjustment to get to the spot you want to be for movement. Has there ever been a guy who separated well by, by their core wasn't strong enough to feel the torque? Um, yeah, I mean, you can have guys that are very highly mobile that land and they can stay completely closed, but they um, don't carry or accelerate a lot of energy. You know, it'd be like, in my era, this ca cartoon figure called Gumby. He was just like, really like made a gum kind of thing. And, you know, it's like, you don't want to be like this long floppy rubber band you want some tension in your rubber band but you don't want to be this tight knotted up rubber band we're always trying to find balance between strength power and range of motion how far can we carry that strength and power i don't i like a better analogy is understanding like how a jet would on a runway would have would take off so a jet's trying to get to 140 miles an hour to take off it needs a certain distance of runway to do that or it can't take off based on how quickly it accelerates. So it, it probably needs about a thousand feet of runway space to hit 140. So if you've only given it 400 feet, you're never gonna get there. And that's really how you need to understand power to mobility. Mobility in this case is range of motion. So it's distance, it's the runway. If you don't have enough of it, you don't have, you, you'll never get to the speed you wanna get. But just because you have a lot of runway, if I had a 3,000 foot runway, but a little prop plane that doesn't really have even the speed to get to 140, it, nothing's gonna happen. So it's that balance of the power of the jet and the distance of the runway to allow them to get to their optimum speed.
Can you talk a little about arm path? Is there a correlation between arm injury and arm straightening out towards second base in the delivery? So there's a, an arm an arm path. So here's the problem, guys. When y'all when y'all think of like, should I be here? Should I be here? All this. The only time the arm is or the, the position of the arm is affecting injury is if it's affecting timing. Uh, and yeah, if it, it's affecting timing and the moment or the inner where energy is moving. So, for example, you could extend your arm straight out when you land, but when your shoulder goes to turn, it needs to come in deflection because it will move better with the trunk. If it stays extended, it's going to work against the trunk. If you see an arm land in flexion and move with the trunk, but as the trunk moves, it flies out, then the trunk is working very rotational and causing the energy or the centripetal force to it, you know, it increase to pull the arm away from the body. And, it, and then the same thing, it creates that just a lot of distraction or drag. So the, the goal is to get this arm to work with this trunk. If it can stay engaged and it can ride and work with the trunk to transfer the trunk's energy, as opposed to pull away from it and work against it, it's gonna be healthier when it works with the trunk. When, if it's ever put in a position to work against the trunk or fly away from the trunk early and work, therefore works against the trunk because you have to continue to pull to get it around, you're gonna put more stress and torque on the arm and you're gonna have problems. So yeah, studies show at pitch release, the arm's more extended at pitch release and flex, you're typically more prone to injury. But if your arm is too flexed, pushing ahead of the trunk, you're more prone to injury. If your arm is more extended at front foot strike, there's no correlation to injury. It's typically more correlation to a, not as good a performance. So a lot of what you're saying, I understand. But just remember, you really, the end of the day, it comes down to is your arm working with your trunk or against your trunk. If it's working against your trunk, you're going to be more prone to injury. High 70s velo for a 5'8", 130-pound, 14-year-old guy on track. At 14, it's hard to know, guys. Like, I've seen guys get better in as they go through their development, their growth years, and their growth plates close. And I've seen guys get worse. So sometimes genetics, going in through your growth periods, your, genet your genetics initially give you benefits in throwing, and then it works against you. And then other guys is it gives you benefits and then you excel out of it. And then some guys do it earlier and some guys do it later. Um, so be careful trying to predict where you're going to be in the game before you've gone through all your growth spurts. So, it, I mean, who knows? I've seen it. I've seen guys 15 throwing harder than they were at 20 because their body got worse or, you know, these things kept thickening up and they lost their range of motion. They actually got more strong than explosive and things dramatically changed. So don't predict your velocity young. Just constantly put the building blocks into place to when you are at your peak maturity of athleticism, you have the building blocks to be at an optimal level. It's all that matters. Riviera, how many pitch can throw in the practice in the week after game I play okay what's you know, pitch count stuff Riviera you, the the best way to understand pitch volume is you got to chart it as stress over time so it's called acute to chronic workload ratios not to get too complicated all you need to do is you should chart your pitches every pitch you Seeing big spikes or a drop.